Um, good evening again. My name is Adam Hughes. I'm the East Tennessee organizer with SOCOM or Statewide Organizing for Community Empowerment. Um, I want to thank everyone who has come together to put together this important community conversation for tonight. Um, I've spent, I think the first time I did any work in, in the Kingston community was about seven years ago um, when I came trying to support some folks who were concerned about the, uh, the new coal ash landfill that was being built in 2015. Um, and I've also done a lot of work in the Claxton community in Anderson County, trying to support people who are looking for a just economic transition um, as, uh, as that plant enters its, its closing phase. Um, I wanna also introduce a couple people who have helped put together and, and have roles on this webinar tonight. Um, Trey Bussey from the um, Southern Environmental Law Center, who's gonna be giving a, a presentation tonight, who's really one of the most excellent, dedicated environmental lawyers I know, who's really gonna help share some information about what this permit is, what it means, how you can get involved. Um, I also wanna introduce Gabby Sari Tobar, who's helping to review comments, helping to make sure things go smoothly tonight and, and review the chat. Um, Gabby's with the Center for Biological Diversity um, and a really important community advocate. Um, so thank you both Trey and, and Gabby for joining. Um, finally, I wanna go through the agenda very quickly. Um, after these introductions right now, we're gonna take some community questions. We're actually gonna open by giving you an opportunity to, to share some initial questions, thoughts, why you joined tonight, really root this in, in the people who are attending. I'll turn it over to Trey, who has a presentation prepared about what this permit means, um, the permit that TVA is applying for, as well as what the future of the Kingston plant is and what that timeline is. We'll then give you a chance again to ask some questions of Trey, ask any informational questions you have about what this all means. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the hearing coming up next week on Monday and let you know how to participate, how to comment. We'll have another round of community conversation where you can ask questions about the hearing or ask questions about uh, um, just anything you wanna make sure is brought up at the hearing, especially if you can't make it. And finally, we'll close by telling you how to RSVP um, and attend that hearing one more time. So we will start by asking very simply, why are you here tonight? Why is this important for you to be here? Why are you joining us? What do you hope to get out of this conversation? And what do you hope to get out of this whole process? And I will help unmute you if you just wanna raise your hand using the little reaction button at the bottom. You can raise your hand and I'll see it and unmute you. Or you can uh, put your question into the chat if you don't wanna go on video and, and we can read it out. Um, so is, is there anyone in the audience who would like to share what brings them here tonight and why you think this is important? Anyone, any questions you have or, or anything you want to get out of tonight's conversation? You can either put it in the chat. You can go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and, and raise your hand or put a reaction. There's a, uh, a question from Joseph Kentz, and, and thank you. Why must TVA release any coal ash into the waterway? Which I think is a really good question. And uh, I think, I hope Trey's gonna be able to answer that. Um, let me uh, ask Gary Pack to unmute. Um, Gary, why are you joining us tonight? Uh, good evening. Yes, my wife and I uh, live on Watts Bar Lake. And we caught this uh, information on uh, Facebook, and we thought it'd be good to understand what uh, TVA is up to here, and echo the previous question. You know, why 
do they want to put any coal ash in the lake, especially after everything that's happened negatively to the, uh, you know, the community as a result of the coal ash uh, spill. So we're you know, seeking for information. Thank you, Gary. That's a, that is a really excellent question. And I think there's probably a technical answer to that, but there are also bigger answers questions about that, that that really fairly you all should be able to ask TVA as well. Um, I'm going to call on John Todd Waterman. Todd, um, please share. Why are you joining us tonight? Well, um, there's a, a Bull Run coal plant is about four miles from where I live. And of course, I'm very interested in what happens to the coal ash there when that plant shuts down and what's happening to it now. And I also have several friends like Julie, who are Kingston survivors, uh, Kingston workers or spouses or families. Um, and, and, uh, and so I'm very interested in it from their standpoint too. Thank you so much, Todd, for sharing. Um, and I'll call on uh, one more, um, Julie Renee Bledsoe. Julie, can you please share with us um, why you're here and joining tonight? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, like Todd was just mentioning, my husband was one of the uh, Kingston coal ash workers. And uh, we knew nothing about coal ash when he went to work there. And we trusted um, Jacobs Engineering and everyone there. and. Uh, that was a very big mistake. Um, so I now feel that, you know, knowing what I know about coal ash and how toxic it is, um, I owe it to my fellow human beings to uh, let them know that, you know, it, it's one of the biggest mistakes we ever made was, you know, trusting my husband's uh, health to work there in, at that place and clean it up. He has over 50 dead co-workers and one of those is his, his own brother. And um, so it's just, you know, wrecked havoc on our world. And sadly it is in our world. It's all over, you know, the United States. There's, there's uh, coal ash ponds leaching uh, terrible chemicals into our groundwater. Um, it's, you know, it's stacked and sadly the uh, laws and the, um, you know, uh, especially our state, they just and TVA, they keep relaxing the laws instead of making more to protect people, they relax them. And it, it angers me greatly. And um, I just, you know, I, I, they've hurt someone I love very, very much. And I don't want to see that happen to anyone else. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Julie, and uh, for sharing your story. Um, I see in the chat Leslie saying um, they need more information, don't know about the Kingston situation, want to know more about the coal ash. A um, few other comments about the sound. Um, I'm really sorry if, if folks are having sound issues, if they're continuing, maybe while Trey's giving their presentation, if you want to send a direct message to me, um, we can try to, to work that out. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, I'm glad that people are here and, and have joined for a variety of uh, really good reasons. Um, there was a question too about uh, the credentials of the experts in this webinar. And I can say as a non-expert that uh, that's probably also a question that uh, Trey, who, who has a lot of credentials should answer. So I will turn it over to Trey. And Trey, do you need, um, Host privileges, do you have something to screen share? I, I can try and screen share. I have a button. Um, let me see if it works. But uh, first, I just wanted to start off and introduce myself. I am Trey Bussey. I'm an associate attorney with the Southern Environmental Law Center, um, along with some colleagues, Amanda Garcia. And I also see Sam Evans uh, on the webinar. So it's good to see everybody here. Um, we work a lot on TVA um, issues and have uh, been following the Kingston um, NIFTIS permit. So I just wanted to share information about what exactly is, is happening, um, what is the upcoming hearing, 
what is TVA asking to do. Um, so I am going to try and share my screen and, and provide some context for uh, what is going on and what we're here tonight to discuss. So let me see if I can do that now. Okay, is everyone seeing a PowerPoint about Kingston? Okay. Um, if you're on this call, I don't think I need to explain uh, the significance of the impacts um, that TVA's Kingston coal plant has had in East Tennessee. I think, as Julie mentioned, um, it has devastated a lot of folks who, uh, communities that trusted TVA. Um, the 2008 coal ash spill is the worst industrial disaster in national history. Um, over 40 workers in the subsequent cleanup uh, have since died. Over 400, excuse me, 50, over 50 have died. Over 400 have become seriously ill. Um, and much of that coal ash TVA left over 170,000 cubic yards of that coal ash in the rivers. Um, it's coal ash pits while TVA no longer, while TVA has dewatered its coal ash pits, so now it has dry landfills, um, it's, its coal ash has had an enormous impact uh, on East Tennessee and, and its pollution continues to impact the region. So to this day, it has uh, a permit that allows it to discharge 14 million gallons per day of toxic wastewater. And we'll talk a little bit about the specific toxins. Um, it discharges, it takes intakes water from the Emory River um, to for its facility, for the coal plant and discharges it into the Clinch River. The Clinch is currently impaired for mercury. Um, the permit as it stands does not have limits on uh, toxic chemicals like arsenic and selenium. Um, many of you have probably also heard announcements or discussions about Kingston's potential retirement. So that's important context for what we're talking about tonight. TVA has not finalized its decision, uh, but it has announced um, that it is considering retiring the Kingston plant as soon as 2027. It is going through an environmental review process that will take, it has already started that process and it anticipates to make the final decision by early 2023. It's considering a few alternatives. Some of them would be at Kingston, um, including new gas plants. Uh, but TVA says it's also considering alternatives like uh, solar and, and battery storage for those solar um, panels. And that would likely be throughout, um, I believe, East Tennessee, but, but not necessarily at the Kingston site. So it's important context that TVA is, is going through this process to consider uh, how and when to retire the Kingston plant and, and what it would replace Kingston with. Um, so the issue that we're looking at today is governed by the Clean Water Act, which require, requires facilities that discharge pollution into rivers and streams to get permits that are called National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permits. You might hear people call these NPDES or NPDES permits. Um, so we're, we're here tonight to discuss TVA's current permit and what it's asking TDEC to do to that permit. Um, it's also relevant that, that the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, uh, sets national guidelines for pollution control and it does that based on the type of polluter. So in this case, a coal plant um, and then a type of pollution and the pollution can be different waste streams. We'll talk a little bit about this, but for example, it could be coal ash leachate, which is what leaches from 
um, the coal ash pits. Um, and so different waste streams are governed differently by EPA rules. But then TDEC takes those EPA rules, which are national in general, and it applies those standards, those guidelines to specific permits. Um, this is a schematic of, of the different waste streams. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, and others might be able to clarify, technically TVA has dewatered its ash impoundments. Um, so some of this is not um, up to date, but this gives you an idea of the different sources that a coal plant will, uh, different types of waste that a coal plant will produce. Um, so as the coal moves through the facility, um, some of the streams that we're talking about in this permit are the bottom ash um, transport water. So here in the first part of this, you see that burning coal generates this ash that falls to the bottom. Um, TVA has used water to send that ash down into an impoundment. That water becomes contaminated um, with toxins. Uh, and so part of what's at issue is what to do about that wastewater. And then another source of water, um, of wastewater we're discussing is from where it says FGD, that's flue gas desulfurization or scrubber wastewater. That's essentially a system of taking what would be air pollution, um, mercury, um, selenium, arsenic, and removing it from the air, but the process transfers it to the water. So you have to deal with that pollution once it's in the water. So that's one of the waste streams that we're talking about tonight. And so this is just a little bit about how, you know, you have all of these toxins um, that would be produced through smokestacks, but there is a system that transfers them from smokestacks into the water, uh, which obviously if you don't treat it right, becomes a major problem. So um, as I mentioned, EPA sets the national standards for how much toxic wastewater is appropriate and is permissible for coal plants to discharge into the rivers. Um, EPA set the first standard in 1982. It was, it was very primitive. They just said, you know, an impoundment, uh, a, an unlined pit is good enough. You'll settle out some of the pollution and you can discharge the rest. So in 2015, EPA took the long overdue step of putting the uh, first significant limits on toxic wastewater, um, on some of those toxins that we've talked about on mercury, arsenic, selenium. Um, in 2015, when EPA said, when EPA finalized that rule, TVA said it would comply. It, uh, it said it would comply by 2022. It began as early as November, 2015, the process of designing how to treat the waste from bottom ash transport water, from wet scrubber um, wastewater, how to treat that so that the bottom ash transport water would not discharge at all. Um, it would be entirely dry handling. There would be no need to send the pollution, the wastewater to, to the river. And the flue gas desulfurization wastewater, the wet scrubber wastewater um, would be treated to significantly reduce those toxins that we've talked about. And so that's November, 2015. Well, um, in 2020, there was a different EPA that was lobbied by industry insiders to create a new rule governing the same waste stream. And so this new rule is less stringent um, it increased the timelines to give utilities more time to comply, to, to install this wastewater treatment. Um, and it created a lot of uh, what are effectively loopholes. They call them subcategories. And for instance, there is a retirement subcategory that says if you retire by 2028, um, you do not have to install 
wastewater treatment systems. And so you can discharge more arsenic and mercury and selenium. Um, this rule has been challenged in court by many groups, in, including the Sierra Club, um, who believe it is unlawful. Um, EPA has uh, already announced that it is reconsidering that rule and has indicated that it may replace that rule with a more stringent rule that's more protective of the water. That, um, it's also referenced the subcategories and has indicated that it will reconsider whether those are necessary. Um, and so that just brings us uh, to today where what is happening is that TVA has asked TDEC to modify an existing permit, TVA's current 2018 permit that should be valid and is valid for several more years. TVA wants TDEC to modify that permit to reflect the 2020 rule, which as I mentioned, is less stringent. It allows more pollution um, or at least allows TVA to stop its plans to install that wastewater treatment system that, um, or systems I should say, that it has planned to install uh, for the past six years. Um, and so that, you know, I will defer to uh, the community to talk about uh, what that means and what to do about it, but, um, you know, TVA is, is after some of you may have seen, it just announced record profits of uh, $1.5 billion uh, this past year. And yet here is a investment it has spent six years on to um, control pollution in a community that is significantly devastated over these years. And, and TVA now says it doesn't want to continue down that process of installing that wastewater treatment and um, wants TDEC to reflect that in the permit. Um, one, a, ch a challenge is that the 2020 rule, while it's being challenged in court, while EPA is reconsidering it, EPA has said it is the rule in effect. Um, what we are, what, you know, our review of this permit and situation um, reflects, we think, first of all, TVA, we do encourage TVA to retire Kingston as soon as possible. And we do absolutely encourage TVA to finish installing that wastewater treatment system um, that it has already spent six plus years on. Uh, it's, it's really important for TDEC in this permit that it's modifying, if it does modify it based on the current rule, despite the fact that EPA is reconsidering that rule, if TDEC modifies that permit, it should include what we've called an automatic reopener. And the draft permit does, which is good, but it's important for that to stay. The automatic reopener would allow TDEC to, as soon as there's a new more stringent rule from EPA that requires more pollution control, TDEC would immediately reopen the permit and apply those more stringent limitations. So it's really important to insist on that. Um, and what we're doing tonight, I think is also an important part of um, the solution community engagement, expressing to TVA, to TDEC, um, the, you know, what the community wants, um, whether that's, and I, I hope that is, you know, to retire um, this Kingston plant, which is a legacy of significant harm in this region, um, but to also take care of its wastewater in the meantime, up until it does retire, use you know common sense pollution control that it was already planning to use. Uh, but just to express your perspective, tell your stories to TVA and to TDEC in this process. Um, and I know Adam's going to talk a little bit more about what exactly that is, how to submit your comments um, and participate in the hearing. So I'll stop there for questions or if I, I know Amanda's on the call, if she wants to clarify anything or if there are questions, I can pause there.
Julie, do you have a question? Um, I would just like to say that this is uh, TBA's history. They kicked the can down the road. And, you know, I believe it was 2015, they were told they would have to build the wastewater treatment plant. And so here we are in 2021, no wastewater treatment plant. They do this everywhere. They, they manipulate, they, they kick the can down the road. While they're telling the community, we've got your best interest at heart, we're stewards of the environment. You know, they've got this whole campaign to make people believe them, when in reality, just follow the money. Th their decision will be based on what's going to save the most money, and what's going to make them the most money. So you can pretty well predict what they're going to do. So the community has got to be strong. The community has got to rally together or it'll just be the same old, same old. And um, like I said earlier, I've learned this the hard way. And um, that is how they operate. Every community they are in, they are, they are finding resistance because people have learned. Science has come forward. We know so much more now about their toxic stew that they're brewing over there. And they're wanting to dump, dump more into the river. And they're going to take the cheapest route and the one that's going to make them the most money. They're not going to care about the water or anybody around it. And it's sad to say, but that is that is what they do. Thank you, Julie. Um, I see a question from Joseph Kintz in the chat, and then we'll get to uh, people with the hands raised. Um, Joseph asks, what is the evidence to show that the amounts and types of pollutants that are now being released to the waterway are causing damage? Um, do you want to address that, Trey? I think Amanda wanted to speak to that and maybe some other issues as well. Great. Um, we'll go, we'll give Amanda. Do you want to go ahead and address that and a few other things? Amanda Garcia, also a lawyer with the Southern Environmental Law Center. Hey everyone, I'm Amanda Garcia. I'm the Tennessee Office Director for the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, first, just with respect to um, Joseph's question, there are a couple of things um, that I think are important here. First, um, I don't know how to turn off this. This is not that important, but I don't know how to turn off my, there we go, the hand raise function. There we go. <laughs> um, so, the first um, thing, Joseph, is um, th this permit modification is about technology-based pollution standards. So they're not based on the um, amount of pollution that is getting into the water or um, is already present in the water. They're based on what utilities can and should be doing what the best available technology is. Um, the Clean Water Act has a goal of not having any pollution go into our rivers and streams. And so um, the first thing to note is just that these are technology-based standards. They're not based on water, water quality. They're based on what can what is economically and technically achieve, achievable by utilities in the coal plant category. Um, so that's the first note. And then the second note is just to point back to what Trey was saying that um, one of the waste streams here is um, what's called flue gas desulfurization <laughs> wastewater. It's a mouthful, um, but basically scrubber wastewater that has um, a number of different toxic pollutants in it, including mercury. And as Trey pointed out, the Clinch River is impaired for mercury. That mercury is not, um, you know, solely, that didn't come solely from TVA. The, a lot of it comes from the Oak Ridge Reservation um, upstream. 
but the fact remains that it, there's more mercury in the Clinch River than there should be. And so, um, you know, this is a, a another waste stream that, that goes into the Clinch River that has mercury in it. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is just to follow up on Trey's um, presentation to just make really clear that, um, you know, the 2020 rule that TVA is has asked TDEC to amend the permit to reflect is the regulation that's in effect right now, even though it's being challenged in court and being reconsidered by EPA, it is the law on the books, um, as they say. And so um, uh, I would, you know, I think while we would like to see TBA voluntarily commit to not you know, to a, a stronger standard um, while it continues to operate Kingston. As Julie was pointing out, um, that doesn't tend to be their choice uh, when they have an option of doing something that might be cheaper and wouldn't cause them to change their operations. So I just wanted to make sure everyone understands that the, the 2020 rule is the law that's on the books right now. It's being reconsidered. It's one of the reasons that we think that the reopener provision is really important here because, you know, when EPA issues a new, um, stronger regulation, we want this permit to be reopened immediately and put those protections in place. It's also obviously like important to, um, keep in mind that if TVA retires Kingston, then these waste streams, at least from the active burning of coal go away. Um, there's still the question of what is TVA gonna do about the coal ash that's already being stored in leaking unlined pits on the property, but that's not what this permit is about, um, or at least that's not what TDEC, how TDEC interprets its permitting authority. Um, so I just wanted to make that, that point really clear. Yeah, I don't know if you want to address the follow-up um, that, that Joseph has in the chat. Where's the evidence to show that current emission levels are too high? I will say, first of all, that um, this permit is not about reducing emissions levels, that the emissions levels will either stay the same, I guess, if TVA doesn't get their way, or the emissions will increase if, if TVA does get its way. So there's not really a on the table option to reduce emissions. But what is the evidence that exists now that, that shows that there have been exceedances? Um, can you address that? And then we'll get to, uh, to, to Gary's question. Oh, um, let me quickly. Sure, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a standard that the EPA applies. It's best available technology economically achievable. So economic achievability of the standard is already baked into the standard. And it's worth noting in this regard, um, as, as Trey was talking about earlier, um, that TVA has you know, had <laughs> since 1982, the last time EPA updated this standard before it was updated in 2015 was 1982. Um, and so they, ha they have had many decades of being, to, of being able to discharge unlimited amounts of toxic pollutants into our rivers and streams. Um, so I think that it's reasonable to request that they update their pollution controls um, to reflect modern pollution controls. There's been a lot of technological advances since 1982. And in terms of, I mean, we don't have a track record of what they've been putting into um, 
the amounts of toxic pollutants they've been putting into our rivers and streams because they haven't been required to monitor for it or test for it um, for, you know, since they started operating the plant. That's why this regulation in 2015 was a big deal. Um, Gary Pack, you can go ahead. Um, do you want to share a question or, or a thought? Uh, one thought or comment and one question. I guess I've been very naive over the years to think that after everything that happened on the ash spill, that TVA has cleaned up their act as far as putting pollution into the river and the lakes. I'm just totally blown away by that. I just wonder how many people in this area really understand what is going on and to the effect, the extent we can make them more aware of it, you could probably generate a whole lot more grand groundswell against this whole effort. But my question is, I'm just wondering, is there any scientific environmental evidence to show that this increased amount of whatever these pollutants are that TVA is putting in the uh, lakes, you know, that it will increase and will harm the wildlife, the fish and everything. Um, I'm just trying to understand if they're putting in a little bit of amount and it's really not hurting anything, they put in just a little bit more and it's really not hurting anything, or do we have scientific evidence that the environment, the water uh, environment is being negatively impacted by these discharges? Thanks, Gary. I'll, Amanda, do you wanna? No, go ahead, Gary, go ahead. I was, I was going to say um, a few things. First, um, to reiterate, like Amanda said, this is what we're dealing with right now is focused on the technology. It's a technology-based standard. So the idea in the Clean Water Act is that um, when EPA writes these rules, they have to require every plant to operate as cleanly as the best operating plant in the country and they have to use that level of pollution control technology. Um, and so it's not, and as Amanda pointed out, we don't, TVA has not been required to monitor all of the um, pollution that it has discharged over the years. I'll add that we do know that the Clinch River, as Amanda mentioned, is impaired for mercury. So there is mercury, I believe, and there have been fish tissue samplings um, showing that it is impacting wildlife. TDEX position is that that is not um, solely from the Kingston plant, uh, but Kingston does discharge a significant amount of mercury and contributes to that impairment. Amanda, did you wanna add anything? No, I will say, I think I, I believe I slightly misspoke. I think they do have to um, do like a grab sample of some of the toxic metals, maybe like once a year or something like that, um, which obviously isn't sufficient to <laughs> actually assess how much um, of those metals they're, they're putting out into the environment, but they do, they, and there are no limits on how much they can pollute. So that's really just supposed to be like a little, you know, data point, um, but it's just a snapshot. It's not necessarily indicative of how much pollution they're putting out. So I just wanted to make that, I wanted to clarify that um, they are, I believe under the current permit um, required to do some minimal monitoring with no limits on toxic um, pollutants in the in their wastewater. Thank you. I see a few more questions um, both in the chat, a few more hands raised um, and I do want to get to those but before it gets too long I want to go over some information on the hearing 
um, next Monday, just so everyone kind of is in position and ready. And I'm gonna send along this information as well. Um, so this new permit that we've been talking about, um, the Department of Environment and Conservation, which will choose whether to accept or reject the, the new NIPTES permit that TVA is applying for, will have a, uh, a public hearing next Monday, November 22nd. It's gonna be in the Kingston Community Center, room A, which is 201 Patton Ferry Road. And this is gonna be an opportunity for everyone to show up and both give comments on the record about whether or not you think this permit should be approved, but also to, to ask some questions and answers of um, officials from the Department of Environment and Conservation. Um, doors are gonna open at 4.45 p.m. and from 5 to 5.30 p.m. there'll be an informational question and answer session. This is gonna be an opportunity for you to, to ask questions, to have a little bit more of a conversation before the formal public hearing starts. And then from 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m., they're gonna hold a public hearing and that's where you can give official comments on the record. However, the TDEC officials will not be able to answer any questions during that. That's giving um, comments that they will consider when making the permit decision. So if you wanna have the opportunity to ask these kind of questions to TDEC officials, you should plan to come from the 5 to 5.30 p.m. period. Um, if you don't want to attend in person, you can also attend virtually during both parts. Um, there's a URL that's going to be in a document that I'm going to put right in the chat and send in a follow-up email um, that you can join to, to log in via your computer. And there's also a call-in number that you can use to, to join and participate fully. Um, in terms of preparing your testimony, um, you will have probably about three minutes. We think it's three minutes to comment. Um, so it's important to know what you're going to say going into it. Um, it's good to have some factual information and have some points on which you're challenging the permit. Um, but it's also important to kind of speak from your heart and talk about why this is important to you. Um, why, regardless of what position you're taking, what brings you out on an evening to go and, and give this testimony. Um, if you'd like help preparing comments, sorting through some of the technical information, um, you're more than welcome to, to contact me. I'll put my address and information and there are a few other people who might be willing to kind of talk you through the process of preparing to comment because I know that can be a little intimidating for people Trust me, I have done it before. And if I can do it, then I know that everyone on this call can certainly do it. Um, so I'm going to share a lot of that information. And I definitely hope that, that people are able to join on Monday. Um, I'd also encourage people, I think um, Gary makes a very good point that uh, more people in the community should be able to, to be informed about uh, what's going on, should have the opportunity if there are people who, who you think that you should, that should be there, be in the room or, or should be able to give testimony on record and you want more materials to help reach out to them, um, we'll certainly able to, to provide more materials to share. So I'm gonna send this uh, um, information about how to comment that was put together by Bonnie Swinford, I believe with the Sierra Club as well as a talking points sheet that was put together by Amanda and Trey of the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, but I wanna go back to some of these questions. I see Kent and then maybe Julie, um, and there may be more questions uh, in the chat. Um, Kent, do you wanna uh, go ahead and uh, ask a question, Kent Minow? Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, not really a question, just a brief comment because I think some of the uh, some of the question and answer here is sort of based on the idea that uh, the the coal ash pollution might not be uh, making a big difference to the drinking water quality of local communities, and certainly that's true in my community here in Knoxville. But it's kind of also not the point. Uh, and I think uh, Amanda made a good point where she used the word bioaccumulation in uh, in the chat, and the point is that there is really not a freshwater body in the entire country that in the last 
40 years has not had an advisory about like, don't catch the fish and eat them here because, and the reason is methyl mercury. And when that mercury from the FGD that Trey was talking about gets into the water, it sinks to the bottom. And in the bottom, there are microorganisms that consume that get eaten by fish and other life. And that goes up the food chain so that finally kids who eat tuna fish from the ocean uh, get learning impairments that uh, they experience in school. And when they stop eating the tuna fish, gradually they recover their abilities. And, and, and so it's something that affects everybody on the planet, not just people in local communities worried about their water quality. And that's why the rules that Amanda and Trey are talking about are EPA rules, they're nationwide rules. Every utility needs to reduce its pollution as much as possible. And that's why we're having this meeting. Anyway, I hope I didn't take up too much time with it. Yes, thank you for that, Kent. Um, I'll also, um, Julie, you have your hand raised. Um, you wanna go ahead? Yes. Um, about, you know, it seems like I'm hearing, you know, is this really toxic? Is it really gonna make a difference? So I would like to inspire you to uh, go online, find reputable resources, and look at studies that have been done. Uh, there's Physicians for Social uh, Justice. Um, there's uh, Earth Justice. There is a body of research over, over a long period of time that you can access very easily. Just type in, is Colash toxic? And, and uh, you know, just start digging and start reading and uh, you, you will be quite amazed. Um, but if someone was dumping this arsenic, you know, where you're gonna garden or where your children are gonna be playing um, or, you know, any of the, the cancer causing constituents in colash taken separately and, and put into an environment where people were gonna be, it, it would not be allowed. But the way the EPA works, the EPA works to ensure that industries can keep being in business. Um, and they may be releasing toxic things and they, they're aware of that and they know that. But this is sort of like the cost for doing business that they allow. So what TVA is trying to do, even with all the research and even with all the people that died working at Kingston, there's, and even with all the money they're making, they're still wanting to inch back into, uh, you know, habits of the past. And, um, you know, it's really not a question of is it, is it toxic or is it making a difference? That has already been proven. It is most definitely toxic. Um, you know, I'm not a, a scientist, but I am a wife. And I watched my husband sit up and, and couldn't even lay down flat and cough his head off for two, two, two and a half years. I've been to multiple doctor appointments with him. I've had doctors stand and tell me Colash is toxic. It most certainly is toxic. You have doctors all over this nation talking about the toxicity of Colash. And I would like to also inspire you just to look around and see how many cancer cases you have in your community. Um, I, I was able to go to Washington when they were trying to uh, change the laws and relax the laws in 2020. And while I was there, I met people from all over this nation. I met people from Puerto Rico. They had a big storm hit the island of Puerto Rico and it blew coal ash in the people's window seals and inside their homes, it was everywhere. Puerto Rico ha now has a law that coal ash cannot be stored on their island. There's a company in Virginia that owns the fossil fuel plant there now. So many people that live next to those factories, those coal ash plants were sickened and died. It's happening in China. They're burning more coal than anybody. And the children and the people that live around that, they have no EPA. What little EPA we do have, they don't have that. So, you know, it's happening all over the place. We've been burning coal for a very, very long time. And we have a lot of coal ash that is a result of that. And it is in leaching pits, leaching into our groundwater. It is in our air. They've actually built playgrounds on it. And they, listen, when we went to Washington, everywhere we went, they were there before we were there. TBA is wonderful at manipulating people and the communities. They're making a lot of money and they don't plan on 
just follow the money. You know, whatever decision they've got to make, it's going to be the one that's the most profitable for them. It's not going to be the best for the community. So I would just inspire you with all my heart to educate yourselves, learn everything you can and protect your community. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, one final thought, and I'll give uh, um, Todd Waterman, who also has a hand raised, a chance to speak. But one question I have for people, and particularly people um, who have close connections to, to Roan County, who live in Roan County, um, is there any other materials that, that you need that you'd find helpful in order to prepare people to give comments at the hearing, to attend the hearing, to let people know what's going on? Um, is there anything, anyone who we should be reaching out to or, or anyone who it would be helpful, any materials that it would be helpful to have to help you do the outreach to make sure people just know what's going on and know about this opportunity at the public hearing? So I'd love to, to hear any thoughts, questions, comments. Again, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand to that. Um, but I'll start by going to, uh, to Todd Waterman, um, who, um, sorry, losing you in the participants list. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, um, this is a question for one of the SCLC folks. Uh, I, I've heard widely ranging opinions on how dangerous the radiation in coal ash is uh, relative to the arsenic, mercury, lead, barium, et cetera. Uh, what's, what's your assessment of that uh, from the literature? Do you think, do you think the, is the radiation a serious concern? Should we Amanda, be commenting on that? Unmute. We can hear you now, Trey, um, and I'm trying to. Yeah, Todd, thanks for that question. I mean, I think, um, I don't wanna comment on that tonight because it's not an issue in this, permit um, and I think there are the circumstances can vary significantly um, it just in terms of exposure and and things like that so I, I'm gonna let that one um, we can talk about that one another day Any thoughts on outreach, who we should be reaching out to um, before Monday and, and how to just get the word out and let people know what's going on? Um, Kent, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, recently, I've been in touch with some people um, in uh, um, uh, Crossville, uh, and they're fairly near the Kingston plant. And uh, there's a group there that uh, I think uh, I can connect with and mobilize and try and bring them into the meeting on Monday, either virtually or in person. Excellent. Is there anything you, you need to do that or, or what, what other information in general is helpful to, to invite people in? Uh, no, I, I don't think I need anything. In fact, I was just talking to them on the phone this morning. They're Sierra Club members. I've got the contact information and uh, I believe they'll be rare to go. Uh, so I, I think we've got what I need. Uh, I've got what we need. Um, and I think in terms of the stuff that's presented online also, uh, the just the 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 nifty's uh remarks that have been submitted uh, i can send those out and they'll they'll work excellent well all of the information that that i've sent 
how to contact me and, and others for follow-up. I'll include Trey's information as long as that's okay with you, Trey. Um, we'll send in a follow-up to everyone as well as the talking points and information on the hearing on Monday. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined and participated in this. I hope this has been helpful or the follow-up information is helpful. Please be in touch if there's anything else we can do or anyone else we can talk to to, to help prepare people for, for Monday. Um, I know this is very important and, and what's going on in Kingston as they prepare to put it on a retirement schedule, as there's discussion of building out natural gas infrastructure. Um, this is something that's important, I know, to, to SACA members and important to so many people in the community. And I'm happy to do whatever I can to help people organize and, and use their voices and make sure that that communities are the ones who are empowered to make the decisions that are going to impact their own lives. Um, thank you so much to Trey. Thank you so much to Gabby. And thank you so much to everyone who, who gave really thoughtful and emotional comment tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you all have a good evening. Um, we'll follow up with information on how to access and share this recording as well. Have a good night.